So we're, we're going to finish off talking about wind. Uh, now, I know there was a, a question about capacity. Hopefully this will get answered as, as we go through the final part of today's lecture. I'm going to give you an example of a wind farm uh, and wind power. And actually, this is from Whiteley's wind farm, which is just south of Glasgow. So this is up in the hills just south of Glasgow. It's the largest wind farm in Europe. And so Glasgow University is actually, well, it's just off the screen to, to the left here. But um, on a good day, if you stand beside the university tower, you can actually see the wind turbines from Whiteleys turning in the distance. Um, Whiteleys was built with um, a number of years ago, and they've actually updated it. But what I'll give you here are some of the numbers for the updated Whiteley. All the um, wind turbines that were built have got blade diameters of 82.4 meters. Um, in total, 136 tons had to be put in this site. So you can see that there were multiple roads put in to allow uh, different lorries to actually carry uh, these things to the site. The generators are rated at, at being 2.3 megawatts, and the average wind speed is seven meters per second. Now, in fact, if you go to Whiteley's, there's, oops, Whiteley's actually has a visitor center, and there they also have a lot of data over the generating um, electricity on the side. So I think there was a question about capacity. Capacity, you basically have to measure, the capacity factor, you have to measure locally wherever your wind turbines are. So at Whiteley's, um, it typically has been each year running between 27 and 33%. So what I'm going to do for the calculations here is be generous and use 33% the whole way through. Now, the average power from a single windmill, so our efficiency times capacity factor times the, the power generated. So if we do, let's give, you know, the Lancaster bets limit is 59%. Let's go a little bit below that, assuming these are quite efficient. Our capacity factor is going to be a third. And we're going to put in a half times our area. Well, we use the 82.4 meter diameter to work out the area. Our density is 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter. And our velocity to go in here is seven meters per second average wind speed. So we can put these numbers in and we end up getting 198 kilowatts. So students sometimes get a little bit confused and ask the question, you know, I go to the site of Siemens or another wind turbine manufacturer and they quote the generators at 2.3 megawatts. But you have to look at capacity factor, uh, the efficiency for the wind speeds of a local environment and the average wind speeds to actually see what you're going to deliver on average at a particular site. So, you know, at some periods of time when the wind is stronger, you're going to get much closer to your 2.3 megawatts. This is typically the maximum that the turbine will actually be able to achieve. But also there's going to be times where the wind doesn't blow. And so this is the average generating power um, over a whole year that you'll get. So that's really what the capacity factor and what these numbers mean. Now, if you're wanting to design a wind farm and actually use the electricity and the power for powering a, a village, a town, a city, it's this average value that is much more useful because that's actually what you deliver. Um, and you'll then have to work out the makeup for the other generation systems. Um, and again, you know, the problem with wind is that you don't know when you're going to have the wind blowing and when you're generating electricity. So the real problem with wind is that you need to have some alternative because the wind doesn't always blow. So it is renewable, it's low in carbon, but it's not a guaranteed, it's not there 24 seven at any time when you need it. Now, 
there's always a question over how dense can you actually make the wind turbines? <clears throat> well, again, if we go back to streamlines and you look at Bernoulli's equation, you can get a rough idea. And in fact, it basically comes down to how the pressure changes and when this may recover um, and you get back to having u naught. there's a particular distance apart you actually require to have the, the turbines and the rule of thumb that um, I'm not going to derive and show, but from industry and uh, use and design of different wind farms, basically you want the uh, turbines to be spaced by about five times the blade diameters. So if you do that, then basically what you end up with is that you get out of the wind shadow from one turbine and the next turbine on average is back to having u naught. Now I'm not going to prove that, um, that's just something that the wind uh, industry typically uses. So let's do a quick calculation here. You know, it's something I showed an answer to in lecture one, but the power per windmill divided by the land area per windmill. So for Whiteley's, we had 198 kilowatts is the average power output. <clears throat> We've got the blade diameter, and if the average blade if the average spacing is, is five times D, the area that each one takes up is going to be five D all squared. So if I do this, we had 84.2 as the meter as the blade diameter. We take the square of this. <clears throat> you can see that the average power per ground area of the wind farm is, is only 1.1 watts per meter squared. So this is where this low density number came from in lecture one. So wind turbines give you renewable and sustainable energy. It's a very low carbon uh, generating form of electricity, but the density that you get is very low. So you need an extremely large area um, to be able to actually generate a lot of power. So if we look at Whiteley's, you can look up, in fact, on the internet, you can look up um, the visitor center and some of the data from there. <clears throat> when Whiteley's wind farm started, 140 turbines can generate 322 megawatts of power. This is what all the politicians stood up and advertised. This is what was reported in all the local newspapers and reported on the television. If we take our average, 198 kilowatts of average power. Remember, this is using the known capacity factor and a much more realistic uh, efficiency factor for the 140 turbines. We actually have 27.7 megawatts delivered. So this is assuming a capacity factor of, of one and an efficiency of one. So you might have a maximum value that could be delivered at any one point um, but this doesn't happen all the time. This is much more consistent with the average delivery that you're getting from the center. So you can see here, you're getting pretty big numbers to get there and extremely high wind speeds to try and get this 322 megawatts. But wind turbines, low CO2 electricity. The only point I'm really making here, I'm not against wind turbines, it's just you've got to be careful to listen to what politicians are saying and the maximum powers quoted um, are typically, well, maximum powers are quoted, the average and, and what's useful, you've got to do the calculations yourself and it's a lot less than politicians think or claim. <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm putting in a slide here. This is not gonna be examinable um, and I'm not gonna go through it in too much detail but it's really to give you an idea about bandwidth um, and how, how the capacity factor has to be derived. So capacity factor for Whiteley's is typically between 27% to 33% and that's measured. But it also is dependent on the blade designs that you have. And this comes back to the earlier question about um, you know, capacity factors and, and wind turbine design. So the power that you get, that you can get from the wind and extract in a wind turbine, it, it's basically an aerofoil. 
And so it's the lift times the velocity, where the velocity is your velocity of the wind coming in at a particular angle. Now, the, the way you have to calculate this is you, you want to basically um, maximize the tip velocity. So the speed of the blade will actually change depending on the radius that you have going out. So near the center, the velocity is much smaller than if you're right at the tip. And so the tips of these things, if you don't control it with strong winds, these can easily go supersonic. And I'll show you an example of that in a movie um, towards the end of the lecture. But what you're doing here is you, you need to consider the radius you are along the, as a function along the, the total radius of the blade. You get what's known as the tip speed ratio. And in terms of designing blades, this is a key important design parameter. So when you meet the bet's condition, it can be shown that the angle of the blade that you want, or the, the, the tan of the, the angle of the blade, uh, is needs to be related to the, the incident wind coming in U1 at the turbine blade surface, divided by um, the velocity of the blade. And you can do this in terms of wing tip, tip speed ratios. But what it actually tells you you need to do is that the angle of the blade needs to change depending on the velocity and therefore the radius that you have along the blade. So this is why you see the blades being curved and not just being curved, but depending on this U1 and the incident wind velocity, the blade will actually be on something that allows it to turn and to change this angle. And that's all about maximizing the output. So, so this is the answer to the question earlier. Why are the horizontal turbine designs actually more efficient? Well, it's because you, you can much more easily rotate these blades and have a design of blade that is much more optimized across the whole radius. And so in doing that, you increase the wind velocities that you get a high efficiency to extract energy out of the wind. So in fact, this is a plot. It's actually a plot in terms of tip speed ratio, but what you can do is you can work backwards from this. And, and in effect, this is um, you know, the velocity of the wind you have basically along the, um, the X axis. And you can see there's the Lancaster Betts limit. And this, depending on in fact, the tip speed ratio, or if you like the wind velocity, that's the efficiency you have at extracting energy. So this is a real example, actually, from a Siemens uh, two megawatt turbine design. But you can see the maximum efficiency is only about 45%. And also, it's not over every single wind speed you get that. It falls off quite drastically as the wind speeds reduce or get too quick. So one of the things that maybe is not so obvious for, for people that uh, don't understand these uh, tip design or these um, blade designs is that if the wind speed is too high, also the efficiency of extracting energy decreases as well. Now you, you will have a lot more energy available because of the velocity cubed term, but it becomes a real problem. So this is a bit more of the technicalities. It, this is really more as a background. I'm not going to examine it, but I, I know a lot of students ask questions about this um, because you know, there's a big interest in using uh, wind turbines in many parts of the world. Okay, so wind is sustainable, it's renewable, it's very low carbon. What are the problems? Well, we, we've spoken about already one serious issue is it's low density. So you need a lot of wind turbines to actually generate the equivalent of a coal or nuclear fired power station. Also, one of the complaints that comes is wind noise. Now, you know, I've certainly walked um, up to Whiteley's wind farm and you know, walked past many different wind turbines. They're not that noisy but it is one of these noises that every time the blade passes, um, it's a beating noise with a particular frequency. It's more annoying rather than loud. 
So if we sort of look at the scale on the bottom, uh, wind turbines, they're, they're about the same as, as the noises that you typically get at home during a day. Um, if people are walking around or um, you know, opening and shutting doors and so on, they're not really loud, they're just annoying. One of the serious issues with wind turbines, and I'll show you some real examples of this, is because they're mechanical and because they have to be out there in storms, their lifetime is not great. So fatigue of the blades is one of the major issues. And typically the mean time to failure, the best mean time to failure of most wind turbines are 30 years or less. So you do have to replace wind turbines about the 25 to 30 year period. And you also need to do a lot of maintenance. So most of the carbon that you have emitted from wind turbines relates to maintenance, relates to the building um, and manufacture of the wind turbine but also the installation of the wind turbines where you might have to put rods in um, and that has a certain carbon emission related to it as well. So typical failures for rotor blades, you're talking about 240 million rotations in typical. So there's a constant stress that's changing depending on the wind velocity. And, and even though these are actually your mean time to failure is much bigger than aircraft, bridges or helicopters, it's still 30 years is what we're talking about because of the number of rotations wind turbines go through. And you do get failures. So these are, you know, here's one at Whiteley's wind farm that was in the national news in Scotland 2010. So in winter, you can see also again, this was one of the big storms we had in January 2012. So these turbines, uh, basically the brake failed. And so there was enough friction to actually start a fire um, in the turbine casing in the, at the top that completely destroyed this, uh, this wind turbine down near Adrossen. So you can see that you do get mechanical damage and failures. And now I'm, I'm gonna show you an example from Denmark in a movie in the next slide. So, so please watch carefully the next slide. So here's a wind turbine. This is three tons. And that's a transit van with some engineers who have actually gone to um, do maintenance on this wind turbine because the brake has failed. So, you know, th this is, I, I believe it's a hundred meter diameter set of blades. I'll, I'll run that again. So there are people in that van. The blades here were going supersonic before they broke. And that was simply because in a storm, the brake failed and the, the turbine blades um, ended up going to such a high velocity that they broke. Some bits of the blades were found 20 kilometers away, which gives you an idea of the energy and as I said, the, the blade tips were supersonic um, before they ended up breaking. So these things do happen. They maybe don't happen with every wind turbine, but it is quite a significant issue to actually go and monitor the stresses on the blades and try and allow maintenance to happen before those failures. Now, offshore wind is really certainly where the UK has now gone with wind uh, turbines. The great advantage is there's a lot less opposition to planning. So it's much easier to get planning permission. Also typically out at sea, there are higher wind speeds. So again, you can actually generate more uh, electricity than you typically can on land. The disadvantages, well, it's harder to go out and do maintenance. So typically there's higher maintenance costs in the ocean. That's particularly because it's, a, it's much more difficult to go and analyze the blades and look for um, any stresses. You also need subsea cabling to get the electricity to shore. There's larger amounts of damage, so storms tend to be more severe um, off land in the oceans. There's a potential hazard to shipping. And also something that um, 
the, the green community and the ecological community talk about is potential damage to wildlife. Certainly there, there is some evidence that you know, particularly birds can fly into some of these wind turbines and get killed. It's not really fully understood how much of an issue that is. So this is something that nobody fully understands the full impact it is yet, but it's something that um, certainly some of the green lobby uh, actually don't want wind turbines because they claim it's not very good to wildlife. So that's us for today. Um, what we've gone through is Bernoulli's equation. Really, it's the streamlines that are important in this course for understanding wave, tidal and wind power that we've gone through today. So the key formula from today that are important for um, being able to use for hydroelectric generation, the power is the efficiency times the density times the acceleration due to gravity times the head or the height times the volume flow rate. Give you some examples um, of different turbines and which ones are required for different flow rates. The power available from the tidal screen, uh, schemes, the average power is the density of water times the gravitational acceleration times the area uh, times the head squared divided by twice the period. The available power from waves, we derive this equation. And for wind, this is probably the, the most valuable one um, that's um, well, this one and the hydro are the two most used. So power from uh, wind is a half times the efficiency times the capacity factor times the area of the blades uh, times the density of air times the velocity of the wind cubed. And just to remember from the bets limit, this efficiency in here can never be greater than 59% in real turbine systems. So I'm going to stop.